at 3.30, according to me. Are you ready to get started? Ready when you are. All right. Everybody online, thank you. Ah, Tamara is here. <laughs> Thanks, Tamara. We were just saying if we had any trouble with Jeff's internet, we might call on you to fill in some, some gap time. So thanks for being there. Um, all right, everybody, thanks for joining us so much uh, at our um, research seminar. And my name is Cinnamon Moffitt. I am the research program manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, located in Newport, Oregon. And I'll be your host for this talk. Um, as everybody knows now, your mics, cameras, and screen shares are disabled for this particular event, but we hope that you put in any questions into the chat box and we'll work through those at the end of the presentation. Also just wanna let folks know that we are recording today's event. Um, and if you are interested in watching it again, um, or you would like to share it with somebody else, I just put that link into the chat um, and it will be up probably by the end of Friday, but give me a little bit of time. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to process. So uh, I wanted to make a couple of quick announcements. Uh, hoping that everyone can join us next week, April 7th, when we have David, um, Cade, I'm going to say Cade, uh, is a postdoc from Hopkins Marine Station who will be talking to us about size limitations with whale and gulf filtration feeding. And the exciting news is we this talk will be a hybrid. That means that we'll have a remote and on-site option and everyone is welcome to come on-site at the Marine Studies Auditorium. So if you're ready to be back, you're welcome to join us on-site. And if you are still uh, working from home or you would like to watch from somewhere else, uh, feel free to join us remotely. The other thing that's pretty exciting is because there's no food or drink allowed in the auditorium, but uh, seminar has always historically had coffee and cookies. We are going to do a coffee and cookie social um, from 3 to 3.30 before the, stop, the talk begins. Just bring your own mug and we'll provide the coffee and the cookie. So uh, we're starting to come back to on-site, so we're very excited. So hopefully you'll join us next week, April 7th, for our on-site or online talk. The other thing I wanted to plug is Marine Science Day, which happens next Saturday, uh, April 9th from 10 to 2. This is Marine Science Day online, but we will be having live streamed events, including things like a shark dissection um, and a tour of the new iLab, in addition to our keynote speaker, who is Lisa Balance, who will be talking about some of the work that the Marine Mammal Institute does. So I'm hoping everyone will be able to join us. And again, if you're unable to come on Saturday, um, that site will be live for the next Next year. So you'll be able to see all the things there. Now, if you're interested um, in any of our events, you can always go to the HMSC homepage, scroll to the bottom. There's a calendar of events there, and you can click on any one of the events and you'll get all the login information if you would like to join us online. I'm also going to make one more plea. I have an open date in our spring calendar for a seminar on April 28th. If anybody knows somebody who is interested in giving a talk and connecting with the HMSC community, please let me know. We also have four open dates still this summer. So if that might be a better option for somebody, let me know. The seminars are a great way to connect with the greater HMSC community. So I'll leave my plug alone there and uh, we'll move on to what's happening today. Uh, so let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, Jeff Beeson is with the Cooperative Institute of Marine Ecosystems and Resource Studies or SIMRS and NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Lab or PMEL at Hatfield Marine Science Center. Um, he received his bachelor's of science in geology at the University of South Florida followed by his PhD in marine geology and geophysics from Oregon State University's College of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Science. After completing his PhD, he worked with um, a as a geo consultant, doing a bunch of work on large international seafloor expedition projects. In 2019, he joined Simmers and PMEL as a marine geologist um, in the ocean, Earth Ocean Interactions Group. Since joining Simmers, Jeff has conducted research on methane seeps occurring offshore in the Pacific Northwest and on the seafloor deformation at Axel Seamount. So Jeff, the stage is yours. Please take it away. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Cinnamon, for that uh, nice introduction. And uh, my work, yeah, has uh, included methane seeps and Axial Seamount since uh, returning back to Oregon. 
Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about some of the methane seep exploration work that myself and the group that I joined here has been undertaking. Uh, you can see on the screen a, a nice downward view of, of our backyard and our home in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, real quick, just the bathymetry, uh, sh the color shaded bathymetry, the rainbow color, is the areas that we mapped. And I'll get into what mapping is later. But And the uh, diamonds are locations of our dive locations, dive sites. So you can see on this cruise, this expedition, we covered a lot of grounds and went to a lot of really uh, unique areas. So I'm excited to show you some of the uh, data and some of the results that we um, collected while we were out there. So let me go to the next slide. Okay, uh, this is just a more canned look of uh, the title, initial results from the Nautilus Exposition. This was Nautilus Expedition NA-128 Cascadia Margin Seep Exploration. It's supported by PMEL, Simmers, Oregon State, Nautilus Oceana Ocean Exploration Trust, which is a nonprofit, and NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration. Couldn't be done with all those people. We also had collaborator collaborators from UW and, and, and a few other ones too. So can't get into this little outline. We're going to talk real quick um, about what is a methane seep, if you don't know, and why we care about them. <clears throat> or at least I'll try to convince you why I care about them. Uh, and then we'll get into real, we'll quickly talk about how to locate them from ships. And then what we do when we found them on ships and want to go explore them with more detailed methods. And then I'll get into the uh, highlights or some of the highlights from our NA-128 cruise. And then we'll wrap things up here at the end. Hopefully the timing will uh, be pretty on par. So let me just make sure I'm cognizant of that. <clears throat> Okay, so what is a methane seep? So it's a point source on the seafloor that where gas is emitting or venting from the subsurface into the water column as bubbles. And there's often, potentially there are times when um, other things are seeping out as well, like oil or other hydrocarbons. Uh, and those go into the water column as bubbles, and then they can reach the atmosphere at times and uh, release into the air. So we kind of zoom in. These kind of come in a number of uh, manifestations on the seafloor, and where they come from is also uh, variable. Uh, you can have a deep source of methane or gas that's coming up through fractures or cracks in the seafloor that then pool into shallow reservoirs, that then those shallow reservoirs have connections to the seafloor where they bubble out and they release. And that uh, gas is dissolved somewhat into the ocean and is consumed by microorganisms in the water column, or it reaches the surface and uh, push, puts uh, gas into the atmosphere. You can also have uh, Biogenic sources, which is the breakdown of organic material by living things in the sediments that can uh, fill gas reservoirs in the shallow areas of the subsurface. And that too can uh, emit gas into the water column. Or you can have very large eruptions. These, these are called mud volcanoes. They act similar to magmatic style volcanoes where a uh, connection to a large reservoir has a uh, cataclysmic event or some very large release of gas, and you can have um, big releases of mud and oil and gas. So this is these are uh, another manifestation of seeps. And they support life on the seafloor in unique areas where there's chemosynthetic organisms that are living off of, or there are organisms living off of the, the energy created by the seeps that then support other life in and around them, creating these kind of oasis of uh, biology. Um, so why I care about them? So met methanogenesis or the create like methane creation, methane is an important process in the global carbon cycle. Uh, there is, methane is a 
significant green, greenhouse gas. So our understanding of the contribution from the ocean into the atmosphere is uh, important and largely poorly understood. Uh, there's an unknown amount of methane fluxing through the continental margins. Uh, and there is up to, from some studies, it says up to 5,000 gigatons of carbon stored in ice, icy methane hydrate. And methane hydrate is a ice methane that has solidified under very cold and high, temp, high pressure environments into a solid block. And we'll look at that uh, during this cruise. We, we did encounter methane hydrate on the seafloor. Uh, these seeps also support chemosynthetic communities. Like I said before, they are an energy source. So they are a very uh, unique seafloor feature that supports life uh, at the at great depths where there may not be other food sources. And they provide pathways and the transport of material from deep within the earth through these natural pathways that allow us to collect samples and learn about what's happening deep in, uh, potentially deep in the earth. Uh, and if you were to you know, ask, okay, well, that might be important if there's a few of these out there. Uh, over the last decade or so, there's been a great, uh, recognition of seeps uh, in the Pacific Northwest. So here from a paper by our very own Susan, Susan Murley, if you're from Simmers, Murley et al, 2021, uh, documented over 3,500 bubble streams that are clustered into 1,300 emission sites. So if you were to go back uh, a decade ago, there would be a handful of dots on the, on the map here on the right. And over the course of the better part of this dec last decade, uh, the compilation of seeps has grown to thousands. So there, this is a large process occurring on our margin. And it's only recently that we have grown in the understanding to know its size and scope and are starting to do detailed exploration of uh, what's happening at these sites. So let me keep going. So how did we get the methane seeps on the seafloor? Well, here, uh, one of the primary ways is using shipboard multi-beam data. And this screen grab here uh, of all these green lines are ship tracks that have multi-beam data collected with it. And multi-beam data gives you an image of the seafloor in a number of ways and an image of the water column, which I'll show you in a, in a couple of slides from now. So in reality, so the, the big takeaway here is that there's a lot of data. There's a lot of data that's collected on transits and during surveys. And you take all those green lines and you spend a lot of time and a lot of careful detailed interpretation like and have someone like Susan who dedicates the better part of a decade on compiling, interpreting and generating these big data sets and to uh, present to the community that there are a lot of methane seeps occurring, uh, a lot well, of methane seeps occurring in the Pacific Northwest to be specific to what Susan was uh, presenting or what she uh, did her research on. <clears throat> so if we wanna go, okay, how do we find them on the seafloor? Let's dive a little bit into um, that question of how we locate methane seeps on the seafloor. And I'm gonna give you a little tutorial on some seep hunting. Uh, the image here, this color shaded bathymetry has uh, bright colors are shallow and blue, blue cool colors are deep. Uh, and there's a hill shade behind it. And I'm gonna just walk you through what a uh, methane hunt would look like in this case. So we would first look at the bathymetry, which tells us the geomorphology or the shape of the seabed. And, the un and that shape can reveal the underlying processes that are occurring. So just right off the bat, you can see there's ridges extending out to the Northeast. These are undulating seafloor features. There's a series of faults occurring in this map. You can see them offset, offsetting some of these ridges and making these uh, you know, liniments. There's also hard ground, or there's these hard lumps or you know, small features that look some semi-circular. So you'd go, okay, there's something here, there's there's some unique small features there. But then we can take away 
the color of the, the depth by color and look at the reflectivity or how reflective or how much energy is coming back to the ship when you're emitting the acoustic noise or acoustic signal from the multi-beam transducers. So we add a little bit more context here. The bright, the red colors are now harder or more reflective and the blue colors are softer. And you see there's kind of an increased number of small high backscatter is what this is. Uh, and that these high backscatter spots coupled with these uh, mounds you'd start to think these could be related to seafloor seeps. These are possibly the chemosynthetic communities creating a unique spot on the seafloor that are making a mound and, or there's a carbonate production or rock you know, precipitates occurring. But what really has catapulted our understanding of where the seeps are is this next uh, component of uh, mapping which is water column backscatter, which has been a game changer in identifying active bubble emission sites. So we're gonna take a look at that. Uh, and this is a large component of what Susan used to generate those locations of seeps on the seafloor in the Pacific Northwest. This uh, image at the top is uh, like a, a raw image coming out of the multi-beam where you can see an acoustic flare or what we call a seep, uh, a, a seep event, these are potentially bubbles in the water column that are creating this high uh, anomaly. And this is the seafloor with the seafloor reflection. So what's occurring is in this cartoon that I illustrate down here has a number of beams going out from the vessel and those beams interact with bubbles in the water column. And those bubbles are very reflective. And the, when those bubbles reflect, they send energy back to the ship. And we can record this very similar to a sonogram. This is essentially we're taking a sonogram of the water column and looking at in density differences or uh, things that are very reflective. So this, in, in some sense, if you're confused about this, it's a very sophisticated fish finder. Uh, fish finders work in a similar way that swim bladders and fish have uh, gas in them and that when you send acoustic noise and they interact with their swim bladders, they send back and you can see schools of fish in similar ways like, like this. So let me take you into a example of a ship moving through uh, on a survey and collecting data uh, that's water column and looking at a seep that is uh, imaged in this data set. So the ship is moving at the peak, the apex of this fan. It's moving along and we come into view a high amplitude anomaly that's uh, emanating or looks like it connects with the seafloor. And we hang out there and you can record it. And we can say there's very likely bubbles coming out of the seafloor at this location. Okay, so one thing that Susan and I have been doing, along with a collaborator here at OSU, uh, Ann Trehu, is that we've been taking this data set and trying to look at it in different ways and process it to better under better uh, characterize seeps from the shipboard multi-beam data. And that this is a, oh, let's get this going. So this is a slice of that water column data moving up through the from near the sea floor and we're moving up through the water column. And this is a plan view or map view of those seeps. And you can see a large bubble plume in the water column here with some small ancillary ones. So you can see as we move through, fanning up through the water column, we can see how the plume or the bubbles kind of change where their locations are. And we can see there's individual bubble plumes in this data set. So this is uh, some, this is not directly connected with the work uh, at the expedition that I'm gonna show you here in just a second, but this is part of my research of uh, finding new and uh, innovative ways to process this multi-beam water column data. Okay, so we have a bunch of seeps. We know where, we know generally 
we know where they are from the shipboard multi-beam data and the interpreting the water column data. Now we want to go and characterize them and learn more details about them. So what do we do? We take ROVs or remotely operated vehicles to get detailed observations. We either can collect time series measurements, high resolution data sets. We can collect gas and fluid samples at the seep sites. We can collect biological samples as well. So in this case, we took the Nautilus in the NA-128 cruise, the 2021 expedition on the Cascadian margin, which went from July 22nd to August 5th in 2021. Uh, there were 11 ROV sampling dives at 13 days. We used the Nautilus and ROVs Hercules and Argus, which are owned and operated by Ocean Exploration Trust. We collected six, almost 7,000 kilometers, square kilometers of water column and seafloor multi-beam data, which is that color rainbow map that I showed you from the first slide. This was a big project cut with collaborations from University of Washington, NOAA PML, NOAA Ocean Exploration and Ocean Exploration Trust. Then you can see this map here that's from our cruise report uh, compiled by Susan Murley that uh, our dive sites are from Southern Oregon near the same latitude as Bandon or Coquille Bank all the way up to offshore of Washington, offshore of Grays Canyon, Grays Harbor. So the primary expedition goals were to explore new methane seep sites along the Cascadia margin and build on two previous exploration crews led by OSU and PMEL scientists. We wanted to explore and characterize biological communities that live at or are supported by this seepage collect in situ samples of methane hydrate and gas bubbles, and collect gas, fluid, and rock samples at seep sites to characterize the chemical and geochemical makeups of the seeps or the areas that where the seeps are located. So our exploration tools, in we have many, but the main ones for this project were the vessel, the exploration vessel Nautilus, which is equipped with a, a really high, uh, a really sophisticated multi-beam system the EM302, it supports the use of the ROV Hercules, which has got high resolution cameras, two manipulator arms, and many oceanographic sensors, and the ROV Argus, which is used as a, a disconnect. It allows the ROV Hercules to be free, but also have a downward facing camera to watch as Hercules operates. So it operates above Hercules and looks down on it and as a communication hub and is this, uh, this other ROV that's used to watch the ROV Hercules. So what do we do at, when we get to a dive site? So we know generally where the seeps are because of our mapping, the shipboard mapping and the databases that we have compiled over the years. We do a quick survey with the shipboard multi-beam again, similar as the cartoon I showed you. Uh, we locate with the, that there's an, we verify there's an active seep. We locate it the best we can with that data set. We pick a dive location interpreted from that shipboard data. And then when we get to the seafloor, we make, we have these two options with the ROV Hercules. Uh, we can be in bubble hunting mode, which the ROV Hercules has a multi-beam system, a smaller one than the ship, but a higher resolution uh, multi-beam attached to it that we can have it facing forward and be in forward looking mode, or as we call it a bubble hunting mode. And you can see these bubbles passing through the beam that's the and indicated by this blue kind of cone in, coming from the multi-beam system on the ROV, and it can give us the distance and bearing. So while there's no light or very uh, poor lighting on the seafloor, we can hover around and look for those bubbles similar to like a bat using echolocation. Uh, also, we can use that same system to, and pivot it and point it down and do detailed high resolution mapping of the seafloor from the ROV to map out the, the small area that the seeps are occurring in, 
but get a really high resolution map. So like I said, these are the, this, this is, uh, we had 11 dives and at nine locations or the number. I'm gonna show you four locations that I think have some really exciting results. And they're gonna be here that I highlighted in these red boxes. Uh, but you can see just from our launch depths on the right side here that we ranged from you know, as shallow as 150-ish meters down to almost 17, over 1,700, close to 1,800 meters water depth. So we had a big range of water depths where seeps are located, and they come in all shapes and sizes. And we're, we're going to take a look at at least, we're going to look at these four that I've highlighted here. So let's jump in to dive 1858, which was at Carbonate Ridge. You can see it's kind of middle-ish, uh, close to offshore Newport or Depot Bay in 570 to 465 meters of water. And this is a video, I hope it's coming across clear to you, is that this is what a methane seep looks like on the seafloor watching a vigorous bubble emission site. Uh, you can see this ridge is very elongated and it's uh, a northwest trending ridge that has a lot of carbonate rubble. And on the, this north side, the northwest side of the ridge has these bubble plumes, bubble seeps coming out. And we went and collected gas and fluid samples and rock samples. And the way we do it is with this gas tight sampler that is filling up the funnel. You can see it filling up here as it goes. We watch it with the camera, the live feed coming back to the control room. And when it's filled up enough, we have the ROV pilots initiate the trigger, which will then suck up the gas and uh, keep it pressurized in its tube, allowing us to sample to, without, with as minimal contamination as possible I think it just happened. It sucked it up. And it doesn't fill the. It doesn't uh, pull the entire volume of the, the tube or the cone. Uh, and then those are able to come back on to the vessel after the dive's over, and uh, sample them and preserve them for future analysis of the composition of the gases that are coming out of the seafloor. So. This site was really interesting when we found these bubble plumes, but uh, as we were exploring, another really uh, exciting thing happened. Uh, we began to be inundated or overrun by sablefish. So this is a downward looking view of from the Argus, looking at the Hercules ROV, being completely surrounded by sablefish. And these sablefish, we believe were being attracted to the lights uh, from our from the ROV Hercules, and it got to the point where we had to like swim away from them, and they kept following us. And it just shows you know, this was very impressive to me that the number of fish that were uh, existing on this carbonate ridge uh, was very exciting. We were all kind of in awe by the number, but were a little frustrated by them clouding our ability to see things. Let me just kind of watch that for a second as you maybe get hungry for seafood. OK. So this was a really exciting dive. It was our first one with uh, check. We found seeps. We found uh, a lot of life at this area. OK. So. Moving on to uh, dive H1860. And that is, uh, we called east of Colm Deep, there's a Colm Ridge, uh, which is a high uh, ridge on the margin or on the, the slope break, or maybe right there. Uh, and we dove on that with a seep uh, that we imaged the night before, we knew there was a seep in the in the region. We surveyed the night before, getting ready for our dive. We had this fan view that kind of echo sounder. Your 
uh, sonogram view of the water column showed a very nice uh, bubble plume coming out of the seafloor. We planned the dive and this bubble plume was gone in the morning. So that was a, a really in, nice lesson for me that I hadn't really considered the amount of the temporal component that these seeps turn off and on uh, very sporadically. But uh, we still decided to do the dive to investigate what the, we knowing there was a seep there. And uh, this image here was collected by the shipboard multi-beam. So this is a 30 by 30 meter bathymetry grid. Uh, and what I'm gonna show you is that what it looks like when you collect the high resolution data set. Wow, yeah, so this uh, seep was, all, was actually part of a almost 250 meter wide uh, crater, or at least that's what we were calling it, is a crater on the seafloor that the seeps were imaged the night before down in the bottom right southeast portion of this uh, large feature. Uh, but you know, doing the multi-beam mapping from the ROV in the seafloor mapping mode revealed this very large feature that was very unique. Like it was very uh, exciting and uh, posed a lot of questions about formation. And this is something we're you know researching and looking into. You know the formation of a feature like this uh, related to see uh, you know methane emissions or gas release or maybe it's an old mud volcano or something like that. But what we did find on the seafloor here was some interesting life and some thin carbonate outcrops with an octopus here hiding under this little ledge and a crab. So these were uh, some, just a quick snip of our exploration around the crater. See, this was a, a meeting that this group was having. I don't know what they were talking about. But see the crab got spooked. Everybody kind of just stays around. Okay. Now this was a really neat one. Although the seep was gone, uh, clearly a seep feature that has a long uh, kind of formation history. So our next dive that I'm going to show you is actually two two dives from the same site. And this is H1861 and H1862. And these are at Northwest Coquille. And so this dive site has a really uh, interesting you know, story of why we went there. Uh, this dive site is our farthest south at uh, offshore Bandon at the base, near the base of slope, near the deformation front. Uh, it's in 1780, 1770 meters of water. And it was, it was located in a previous survey by Susan. And then last summer before our expedition for seep exploration, I was on the Marcus Langseth seismic cruise to study the Cascadia subduction zone. And that cruise collected a seismic profile over this seep. And that profile here, this, this is a preliminary processing of that seismic profile, which the seismic profile looks very deep into the earth and, see, and uh, can image layers and deformation and give us, idea, give us uh, information on what's occurring very deep within the earth. And when I collected, when I was on board collecting this data and looking and interpreting it, uh, I came across this seep which was imaged in their multi-beam data as well. And what was noticed is this uh, feature in the seismic data known as uh, BSR, which is a bottom simulating reflector, which is an indicator of gas in the sediments. And this is the, typically like the base of hydrate stability zone, which we won't get into, but if we zoom in on where the seep was co-located with the seismic profile, we see that this BSR, which is indicative of gas, 
is deflected towards the seafloor. So these arrows are kind of tracking it. And normally BSR tracks at the same depth below the seafloor. And that's why it's a bottom simulating reflector. But in this case, it had jumped and deflected to the top. So my interpretation on the, on the vessel and what I ended up bringing back to Tamara and Susan and the team was that I think we have potentially warm fluid upwelling and destabilizing this BSR. I think the gas is potentially being advected upward through warm fluids. So we planned a dive site at this uh, at that seep site. And let me play while that's going. Uh, we ended up having some issues with the ROV, but uh, before the issues were caused us to cut the first dive short, we were able to find a one of the seeps and get an image of it and get get some eyes on it. And if you look very closely, you can see some bubbles escaping from the seafloor here. But what is more was more exciting to me is that I knew there were bubbles from the, the water column data is that this shimmering fluid coming out of the seafloor is indicative of warm fluid. So this warm fluid was, a, was hypothesized to be there from the seismic data. We went down, we found it, and the seismic data uh, was, uh, we were able to co corroborate that interpretation by the warm fluid. So we also, when we went back down on the second dive, we took the temperature probe that's on the vessel. And I've sped this up a little bit, but you can see that's the temperature probe going into the seafloor at one of these warm fluid venting and bubble sites. And I've now overlaid the temperature probe data here in the top left of the screen. And you can see that the ambient water temperature is roughly 2, 2.1 degrees C. And then within the hole, this temperature probe records a max of 17.5 C or 61 or 62 degrees Celsius. So that's still pretty cold for me, but uh, very warm for almost 1800 meters water depth. So we're really excited because this is the second known warm seep uh, on the Cascadia margin. It's the deepest one. And the fluid samples, we're hopeful, uh, the fluid and gas samples are going to in, tell us potentially where the warm fluid is coming from, if it has a magmatic uh, component, or if it's just coming from very deep in the geothermal gradient has warmed this and that there's a very strong conduit of uh, fluids coming from deep within the earth as like a warm spring on land, You similar to that. So this was very exciting. So now we have the seismic data, we've got the seafloor imagery data from the ROV crews and now the, the samples that were collected. Okay, we're gonna keep going because I see my time. Uh, our Next uh, dive site is Astoria Canyon. So that's the continuation of the Columbia River. It's the offshore canyon that connects the Columbia River with the deep sea here. The Astoria Canyon, uh, depth of the canyon floor is roughly 750, 8, 750 780 meters at this location. And it's a, loca it's a site where we had uh, known that there was exposures of methane hydrate on the seafloor from past uh, exploration dives. And one of the goals of the expedition was to collect methane hydrate with a methane hydrate sampler and to collect gas bubbles uh, in the same area. So we play this video for you. You can see us cruising around the seafloor and we come across this uh, outcrop of white material that it is uh, exposure of methane hydrate on the seafloor. And you can see on the right, there's a bubble plume of bubbles coming out of it. So this was really exciting. I had, had not, I had not seen um, 
massive methane hydrate before, but uh, with just some context, the hydrate stability zone is, this is this hydrate at this water depth and the temperature at the bottom of the canyon, this hydrate should, should stay in ice form, which is locking up the, all the methane that is inside of it. But what we're interested in is, is this methane hydrate going through any sort of dissociation processes where it's releasing its gas? And you know what happens as uh, warm waters on the seafloor could potentially dissociate this uh, methane hydrate and release a lot of methane into the ocean and maybe the atmosphere. So this was really neat. Uh, it's exciting because we got to use Tamara Bomberger's uh, methane hydrate sampler, which is this very fancy tool that you push into the methane hydrate and then you use the ROV arm to twist it and it takes a very small volume, but then saves it and keeps it at, um, it keeps it from dissociating because we're collecting it at where the ice is uh, solid and it's able to maintain all of its integrity of the sample without trying to take this from a sample on the ROV with like if you just grabbed it and as if the ROV went up to the surface, it would just turn into bubbles and it would dissociate. So this is really exciting that we got to collect those samples. Okay, so I'm like 34, good. So that's all I'm gonna show you for the cruise stuff. We had a lot of really exciting uh, dive sites. Uh, the cruise is over and you're maybe wondering like, okay, now what? So we're running chemical and geochemical analysis on gas and fluid samples. Tomorrow's really leading a lot of that with some UW colleagues. Uh, there's a concentrations of methane, other hydrocarbons. There was you know, a number of people were out there taking eDNA samples. Um, there were a lot of uh, biological samples collected. Uh, we're integrating the new bathymetry and backscatter water column into our margin wide data sets. Uh, we're utilizing the seismic data from the Langsith cruise to better understand the where and why the seepage locations are where, the, where they are. Uh, we want to use that high resolution mapping from the ROV in the seafloor mapping mode to characterize all the different ways that seepage manifests itself on the seafloor uh, along the margin. We're doing there people that are doing rock analysis with samples that were collected during the cruise. And like any good uh, explorers, we're already thinking about how to get back out there and plan future expeditions to continue characterizing and exploring these unique seafloor uh, locations. And I'll just do a plug, you know, this was a great team. This was the, the science and engineers and the ROV pilots on the team uh, out on the vessel. I put our simmers OSU teams, people are in our orange boxes here. Uh, and then we've got our UW Secos uh, colleagues in the blue boxes and then all the other people that made this happen. And I'd really urge you, if you're interested, the Nautilus, nautiluslive.org does live streams of their dives. It does live streams of their data collection. I just this afternoon pulled up and you can watch them collect multi-beam data in real time uh, between dives. And then when they go down, those ROV footage that I showed you is, is live stream you know, to, your, to your computer or to your TV. So it's a really great uh, way to spend some time having it on. I know that it, I found myself checking in on them and seeing what they're doing periodically. And their field season has just started uh, in the Western Pacific or Central Pacific. So with that, uh, I'll say thank you for you know, spending the Thursday afternoon with me talking about a really fun time I had. And uh, there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening with methane seep exploration. And uh, if you want to know more, we got a website, uh, pmelnoaa.gov slash EOI for methane seeps, or you can email me or, or ask me anything. And I think that's good cinnamon. All right. Thank you so much, Jeff. Your enthusiasm for this project is, uh, we can feel it. So that was great. Um, 
so we've gotten a couple questions, but for folks that are online, please put any questions you might have into the chat and we can work through them. Um, so the first question that we have here, Jeff, is can you talk about the implications of this research on public policy decisions, kind of thinking around climate change? Hmm. Well, there's a few things, you know, there. Uh, these are really new in the sense that we not they're not new in the knowing that they exist, but knowing the like how many there are, or the and what the distribution of them uh, on our margin. And to to be frank, these are occurring everywhere. There, you know, our margin is not unique uh, in the sense that there's methane seepage occurring in the Gulf of Mexico. There's some on the East Coast, and for, for sure, there's occurring in the Arctic. So. Public policy wise, I'd say there, we're, we're dealing with something that we know is an important component to climate change with methane release. What we don't know is how this, uh, how this fits into the carbon budget. We don't know how much is taken up into the ocean because a lot of the methane is dissolved into the ocean before it reaches the atmosphere. But because of how important methane is, uh, it is probably something we should be thinking about in our climate models. And another thing too is that these these seeps also support unique life, and you know protecting them should be something that we should consider when increasing amounts of seafloor uh, space is utilized for wind farms, cables, infrastructure on the seafloor. So. You know, recognizing that they're in a, a unique seafloor feature that hosts uh, life is something we should consider. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so you might not be able to answer this question because the documentation of these seeps is relatively new, but I was curious if we've noticed changes, increases, decreases, those kind of things that might play into this policy question. Ooh. Yeah, too new. Uh, I think that's, there are areas where in small studies, they've seen changes occurring, even um, the repeat dives that have occurred at the bottom of Astoria Canyon have shown that sometimes these hydrate, massive hydrate blocks of ice are exposed. And then a few years later, they go back to the same spot and they're gone. Have they been buried? Have they dissociated? What is the fate of hydrate as it reaches the seafloor through either erosion and it gets exposed or through warming of the bottom waters and it'll essentially warm it up so much that it'll dissociate. So there, there's clearly there are a temporal component to the seeps, but the data sets to evaluate that are, are not on a big scale, not there yet. But as we keep surveying and as we keep collecting this you know acoustic data and going back out and checking on seeps um i think we'll we'll get that question answered eventually but it, at the moment it's difficult yeah i think as a plug for long-term monitoring of these kind of experiences mm -hmm. so that we can track those changes a um, couple things have come in, just making a note that uh, very little of the shallow margin has been mapped. Um, that yeah. came in from um, Susan. Oh, I bet, yeah, great. Thanks so much for saying that. You know, there is a, you know, we can only put seeps on the map where we've surveyed. And there's a lot of places where we have it. And uh, it does seem that they're not, they're probably there. And there's probably a lot of them in the shallow water that has a much smaller volume of seafloor that it has to, or water ocean that it has to pass through to connect that gas release to the atmosphere. So there could be a uh, significant co contribution to atmospheric methane from the coastal zone from seeps. Yeah, this next question actually is plays exactly on that. Um, they're asking, is it reasonable to infer that the warming oceans that melting methane hydrates would increase uh, and add to the carbon burden? Uh, As oceans so are the, warming. So I think in that, that sense, if you're purely warming the, uh, the bottom waters, 
without with everything staying the same, yes, you'll have more dissociation of hydrate into gas form and then released into the ocean and potentially the atmosphere. In places where it's very shallow, and like, like in the Arctic, you know, there's a there's work, there's people that have seen big dissociation events and things like permafrost melting is this is a very similar uh, similar thing. What is interesting that I don't know if we have a good sense of is that there's a pressure component to uh, keeping hydrate in its solid form that if you're warming the bottom waters, you're also likely raising sea level, which would counteract a little bit of that pressure. So there, it, it's possible that there's components, there's areas where there's, it's almost modulated by those two factors, pressure and, and temperature. But if you were to rapidly increase the temperature, you could kind of shock the system and release a lot at one time. Um, I think that that question is still relatively unanswered and is very important though. That's why creating these baselines and monitoring or potentially getting monitoring programs out for these things would be important to go to know that. Thank you. And um, I'm gonna ask a question cause there's not one in the, the chat. And I just had, this might be a little bit of a detailed question but you were talking about um, the warm fluid that was coming to the surface and the ability to, to go ahead and take a look at the fluid and try mm -hmm. to track where it comes from. Yeah. For my interest, can you talk a little bit more about like where its original location, um, why that matters to us? Mm. Yeah, great. Yeah, great. Thanks for asking because I didn't know if there was gonna be enough time to go into, <laughs> into that. So uh, one warm fluid could, you know, it begs the question, where is the warm stuff that is heating the fluid? You know, that could be a warm body that is in, that's buried there. So you could have like a, a seamount or you could have a magma body or an old magma body, something, something that is allowed, that has a heat source that's outside of thermal equilibrium. So there's some heat there. You could also have it that these fluids are coming from very deep, you know, down in the downgoing plate. So the subducting plate, which is warm because of the geothermal gradient and because of fluids that are trapped in it, if this is, if this shows that we have a con conductivity, a connection between those fluids that are really deep with the surface, that starts to talk, starts to think about the high, the, the plumbing system of the subduction zone. And fluids in a subduction zone are thought to be very important in the, how sticky the subduction zone is. So you can think of it as if you have a lot of fluid or think of it like uh, you're driving and you hydroplane. So if there's a lot of fluid, it, re it reduces the friction. So like a car will just slide on the water. So the subduction zone, if there's a lot of fluid at that interface, it could be sliding easier. But if you're actually dewatering and sending that fluid away, because there's a, a pathway for it to escape, kind of like water you know, tires that have big ridges that push the water away, it gets more sticky. So this could be a indication that this part of the subduction zone is, is more sticky. You know, that there doesn't have as much water coming at those deep, at that potentially where the interface between the two plates is. So there's a lot of stuff that, you know, warm fluids near the deformation front, near that really deep area could, could kind of start instructing us about what is happening with the margin at that spot. Yeah, for folks that know me, they know I'm the emergency manager here as well. And so that was uh, exactly the question I was asking, so. Right, but we, it also, you know, that mark, that section of the margin is really unique. There's a lot of neat stuff about the margin that is, uh, that this could be just a small part of a bigger story of why, why there's warm fluid coming out at 1800 meters water depth right there. Yeah, crazy. Um, so, uh, for folks that are online, um, I'm not seeing questions come in, but I am seeing Jeff, uh, thank yous and congratulations. Um, 
okay, we did have one more question. Okay, so Michael, can you clarify that question for me? So I think it's how is the Pacific Northwest unique with, uh, with methane seeps? Is there anything different here? Oh, thank you. Um, in comparison to other places around the world in the Pacific yeah. Northwest, well, we got there. <laughs> we have a we have a subduction zone that creates a lot of faults and a lot of deformation. So you can think of like the housing. There's a there's a lot of sediment. There's a lot of organic material coming off the off the continent and deposited, and in areas where it's very flat and there's you know, a passive margin, like the East Coast, you have less opportunities for like crunching and building these fault path, these pathways for fluids or gases, gases to get to the seafloor. So the Pacific Northwest is unique in the sense that it has a lot of tectonic activity that could be uh, influencing where seepage is occurring or how much is occurring. So I think that in the sense, that's one of the unique components of the Pacific Northwest. And I'd say this is a really well, in, in terms of the tectonics, you know, we're still learning a lot, but it's a very well studied area that the, the seeps can be a piece of that puzzle that maybe was missing into a really, a really in, well understood or generally well understood margin. So it kind of is like a new thing at a place where we've done a lot of other work that we can leverage that understanding on. Yeah, and just build on what we know and yeah. uh, give it a little more depth. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate it. For everybody online, I hope that you're able to join us either online or in person next week um, when we have our next seminar. Jeff, any last things that you wanna say before we end uh, today? No, thanks for listening. And those were great questions that you know, I always I struggle on knowing how to how far to dig into stuff. And I always hope that the questions will save me on getting a chance to to bring up things that were important. And that's definitely what happened. Uh, and, you know, I look forward as things open up more with um, with Noah and with the with with Hatfield of, of seeing you in person. Great. And for folks online, if you have any questions or follow-ups, uh, Jeff has left his contact information up on the screen um, and there's an information link so that you can go and learn more about the project. So um, feel free to take advantage of both of those if you have other questions that didn't come up uh, during our time together. So everybody online, thank you so much. Uh, and Jeff, again, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. All right, everyone, until next time, talk to you later. Bye. Bye.